are you in this lovely sunny day? I'm Tracy, the project officer for the Cumbernauld Living Landscape and my job is to connect young people to nature. Today though, once I've finished breakfast, I'm going to take you for a walk with me to see wildflower meadows in Cumbernauld. See you in a bit. Before we go for that walk, let's take a closer look at wildflowers in general. In the 1980s, a well-known chocolate brand created an advert with a young red-headed woman sitting in a field full of poppies, painting a woodland scene. That advert stuck with me and being 10 at a time, I thought that's what all meadows were like. I couldn't have been more wrong though. But with a loss of up to 97% of our meadows since the Second World War due to the need at the time for intensive farming changes and add to that habitat loss, I had nothing else to gauge it on. I think a major issue from my understanding was that while I was a Glasgow kid, I was used to the parks of that dear green city, so my awareness of wildlife was quite limited and swayed by the manicured green spaces of the time. And I think today, even more so, awareness is a big key issue here. We're learning more and more about our natural environment, understanding that it has functions, not just for us, but for animals, plants, habitats and so on. John Muir put it simply as, when we try to pick out anything by itself, we find it hitched to everything else in the universe. Everything is connected and by changing one system, we can affect others. And in fact, many of these things are also dependent on each other too and have evolved together for mutual benefit. But back to wildflowers, why are they so important? Well, firstly, this is very important. A healthy wildflower meadow contains a mixture of grasses, flowers and herbs. About 70-80% grasses and 20-30% flower and herbs. These are essential for insect life, which is in turn essential for birds and mammals. Plants and soils are the food foundation of all life and if we lose a plant, say we lost the cuckoo flower, we might lose the orange tip butterfly, either that or they'll start munching into your vegetable patch. It's nature's way of having a trade-off. We extract a lot of resources from nature as well, from grains for cereals, trees for paper, furniture and food, and in between there are plants, more specifically wildflowers. To us, the wildflower may be that dreaded phone or gardens, the invader, the weed, that you just need to get rid of every year. As the writer Nancy Giff says though, a weed by any other name is simply a plant out of place. We have learned to unlove our weeds and I think that's maybe time to change. The Victorians certainly did a good job to ensure generations would be tending gardens in neat straight lines with plants set just so, but wildflower and nature just not like that. We lose a lot of nature and joy when we try to keep gardens or even our local green spaces neat, tidy and almost sterile. Now in this section of our walk you can actually see some plants that benefit us medically. Meadowsweet is a great plant that can be used in teas from root, stem, leaf and flower. It's really good for digestive system. The pink flower that you can see there is valerian and the root of that is actually used to help people sleep. The nettles, as we come along here, these are fabulous in a tea, a soup or even once they're blanched put into a salad. comes out as a spinach flavour but they're also a great nursery. I don't know if you can see this, Let's see if I can zoom in, but they're home to pick up caterpillars. There's absolutely loads of them chomping away. And there's a wee bit of a sting with the tail, but once they're in boiling water, nettles don't have any effect on you whatsoever. You should try a little nettle tea. We have a recipe on our website, comeralllivinglandscape.org. Within the next week, these little guys here will be full to the brim with nettle leaves and they'll go into a pupa and then they'll emerge as a beautiful peacock. Absolutely amazing. Now you might be used to seeing this bright pink flower. It's great rose bay willow herb, also known as fireweed as you can find it in places where the ground's been disturbed, for instance after a fire. Now do you remember earlier I said that there's many species that will actually feed from the grasses? If you get in there, can you see that tiny little moth? That is a lattice teeth and it's feeding on the grass that's there. Oh, I'm really excited at the minute because I've just seen six spot burnets and more than one. And a small tortoise shell. Oh, good grief. This is amazing. I don't know if you can see that little guy. Now 
I want you to compare the life that we saw in the meadow to what you can see in the cut grass area. And I'm not saying that there isn't a place for cut grass, but I really think there has to be a compromise between the people who use the green spaces and those who manage them for the life that they can sustain. Having a meadow come from a woodland edge like this has incredible value for wildlife, leading onto a grass area that people can use with a lot of pockets of habitat like the meadow over there that act like small islands for wildlife. These create wildlife corridors and improve biodiversity. Let's look at some wildflowers then. I'm going to start you off with the daisy family or Asteraceae from the Greek meaning star. It is the biggest flowering family by far with 32,000 species. Now we know this one, it includes the daisies, dandelions, thistles to name but a few. In the image you can see the daisy, it's much larger cousin the oxeye daisy and a dandelion. Now if you look closely at the image bottom left, you'll see tiny individual yellow flowers which make up the centre of the daisy. This is in fact the flowering part and the white petals are protectors of these tiny flowers. Many of the Asteraceae plants close at night for protection. Interesting fact, did you know that the dandelion is the embodiment of the sun, moon and stars? The sun is a bright yellow flower, the moon is a spherical seed head and the stars are the individual seeds in their pappus, this white bit that helps the seed float on the air. To identify these flowers, look for a star-like flower with multiple petals. Our next family are the orchids, or Orchidaceae, with 28,000 species. The UK is home to 52 of these plants. They can be tricky to identify as some can hybridise, but without a doubt they are incredibly beautiful, with their more tropical cousins sought after as houseplants. I would say that it is against the law to dig out any wildflower here in the UK, and more importantly, they wouldn't survive as many plants have special relationship with mycorrhizae fungi in the soils. Without special fungus, the plant would wither and die. Flowers are born in tall spikes with simple leaves with veins running parallel to the leaf centre and edge. The common spotted orchid is a favourite of day-flying moths. Up next, our family favourite and one of the group of plants which supplies us with food too, the pea family Fabiaceae, also known as legumes. With about 19,000 known species, this family is very valuable to us economically, as legumes have been part of the staple diet of humans for thousands of years, with foods such as peas, chickpeas, peanuts, and for those of you with a sweet tooth, licorice. You can see in the image four wildflowers from top left to right, bird's fruit trefoil, white clover, meadow vetchlin, and tufted vetch, the purple one. Recognisable from the irregular flowers with five petals which form the banner, wings and keel which is usually fused. Everyone knows the buttercups. As kids we would hold the flower under our chins to see if we like butter. But did you know that there are over 2,000 species within the Ranunculaceae family including marsh marigold, wood anemone, lesser celandine and 11 different types of buttercup. Incidentally, ranunculus is a Latin for little frog. These flowers contain toxins harmful to humans and animals and the next time you see a cow field, you'll see buttercups. The cows aren't daft. The image shows us top left to right, water ravens, lesser celandine, buttercup and wood anemone. I've introduced you now to four families, but let's see what else our meadows can have. Let's have a look at the flowers and animals that you can find in your local meadows woodland edges, and maybe even your garden. Let's finish up with the last two videos of St Morris's Wildflowers. I hope you enjoyed your journey with us so far and I hope your appreciation for wildflowers has grown just quite a bit more, not just a little bit. So it's important to note as well that wildflowers aren't just for meadows. They're also really crucial for woodland edges. They create great habitat links and a great food source for many animals. 
if you've got an area in your garden where it's a wee bit of a struggle for things to grow, might rake back the soil a little bit, add some native wildflower seed and see what comes into your garden. One of the most vital things about the wildflowers here at St Morris's is that they're a nursery. And not just for butterflies or bees or hoverflies, but mainly for the dragonflies that come up. This is a great site for tenorals to come and be safe, let their wings open, harden out in the sun. And it's a lot harder for predators to see them. If you take 15 seconds, just your time of the day sometime as well, in a site like this, it's very re relaxing, calming and soothing for the soul. During lockdown, our mental health and well-being is really quite important. It's important any time really, but this is a especially tough time for a lot of people. So I'm going to leave you with 15 seconds to just listen to the noises and enjoy.